Well, good morning, HCC family. What, what a great day. What a blessed day. I'm so glad that you're here. What a privilege. Met so many first-time guests that are here today. If it's your first time, I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you at the conclusion of the service. Take your Bibles with me today or your iPhones, your iPad, whatever you have, and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. During, during my childhood, my dad did probably what your dad did for you. Um, my dad impressed upon me the importance of not being wasteful. And, and he did that like most fathers do, by yelling or forcefully reminding me of several truths. Uh, your, your dad probably reminded you of several of these truths. So, so, so dad would look at me and he would say, clean your plate. Don't throw that food away. And then, you know, was the famous, the, there's kids in Africa that would die to eat what you're throwing away. So he would remind me not to be wasteful. Uh, he would tell me, turn off that light. Whenever you leave a room, don't leave the light on in the room. That's wasteful. Um, we lived up north, and so it was cold outside most of the time. And so we'd walk outside or open the door, and Dad would say, close the door. We're not heating the outside. In other words, he was saying, don't be wasteful. My, my dad was notorious for, say, for saying, don't let that water just run. And for some reason, my dad wanted us, even after we flushed the toilet, to lift the handle on the toilet so we wouldn't use all of the water in the tank. And, and so dad was like, we're not going to be wasteful. Um, he would remind me, don't buy what you don't need. And then the famous that I heard that you probably heard, money doesn't grow on trees. You probably heard that when you were a child as well, reminding us not to be wasteful. Now, quite frankly, those were tremendous lessons that I needed to hear. And by the way, lessons that I dutifully passed on to my two sons. So, uh, so, so in the Burkholder household, when Justin and Mark were growing up, you would have heard, clean your plate, turn off the light, close the door, we're not cooling the outside, right? All of those things. You'd agree with me that there are a few things as irresponsible as unnecessary waste. And, and we, have a, we have a tendency in our culture to be wasteful, do we not? We probably throw away more food in the United States that, that, than many cultures eat. Uh, here's where I'm going with all of that today, all right? I'm afraid that many believers waste their suffering. Would you kind of just let that sink in for just a second? Many believers, me, you, my family, your family, we waste our suffering. By that I mean that we fail to realize God's purpose and because we do not real, uh, realize God's purpose or, or, or God's plan, we fail to fulfill God's purpose in our life. Thus, this, this tremendous opportunity to represent God, this tremendous opportunity to live out his patience, his grace, his mercy in our lives, this tremendous opportunity to not waste our faith is wasted because God allows us to go through a trial, a tribulation, a struggle, a suffering, and we fail to realize what God is doing in our lives. And as a result, we fail to accomplish our purpose. That's what Peter's talking about in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. And so if you have your Bibles, once again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2. Today we're going to read verses 18 through 25. And so we'll put them up on the screen. Follow along with me today. In just a few moments, we'll explain the context of what is taking place. But Peter says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good ones, and the gentle ones, but also to the unjust ones. In other words, show respect to those who do not show you respect. 
Verse 19, for this is a great, gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it? All right, so it's like you, you can't be in jail for having broken the law and claim that you're a martyr, right? All right, what credit, what glory is there to have done something wrong and to be punished for it? For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure. Notice this phrase. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. In other words, let me pause there because God is saying that, that he takes notice of our suffering. Whenever you and I go through trials and we go through them in a way that honors and glorifies him, whenever we receive unjust treatment, but, but, but we respond in a Christ-like manner, God sees it. It, it is a gracious thing in his sight, Peter says. Notice verse 21. If you underline in your Bible, underline this phrase. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit or guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him. Jesus continued entrusting himself to God the Father who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. Quoting Isaiah 53, for you were straying like sheep, but because of Jesus, you have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we, uh, we need to hear from you today. So I pray that we would have ears to hear I pray that we would have hearts to understand. Lord, I pray that you would prepare us for what we're going through and, Lord, for what we are going to go through in the future. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take the truth that's found in these verses and, and, and remind us and drive the truth home to our minds and to our hearts. God, help us not to waste the suffering that we experience in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last Sunday's message resonated with our church family. Throughout the week, I've, I've heard from many of you, whether it's in personal conversations or emails or, or text messages, as you shared with me the struggles and the suffering that you currently are experiencing. As we took those cards that, that you filled out and you and you shared from the bottom of our, your heart what you're struggling with. As we read through them, as we prayed through them, our heart was broken with you. By the way, if you missed last week's message, you can go to our, our webpage and watch it. I would encourage you to do so. In last week's message, we talked about or we answered the question, why do we suffer? Why does God allow us to suffer? In today's message, we'd like to attempt to answer the question, how should we suffer? All right, understand that as we saw last week, that, that, that everyone suffers. It's not just you. You're not the only one that is going through suffering. How should we respond to suffering? Now, before we jump into this passage, and we will in just a few moments, I, I'd like to take a second and, and, and refute two myths about suffering. Two myths that, quite frankly, are ingrained within our culture. Uh, two truths that even are ingrained within the Christian culture, not just the American culture, but within the Christian culture. And if we're not careful, these myths distort our view of suffering. And so today I want to kind of uh, distort those, or, or not distort, I want to I refute those two myths. It's not my job to distort up here, it's my job to tell the truth, right? All right, if I'm distorting anything, let me know. The first myth is this. God's purpose for your life is not happiness. God's ultimate purpose for your life is not 
happiness. Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychiatrist who spent three years in a Nazi death camp, observed as he was there in the Nazi death camp, a psychiatrist who was a prisoner in the Nazi death camp, watching his fellow prisoners suffer, himself suffering, watching many of them go to the furnaces and come back, and observing how those prisoners responded to that suffering. He wrote a book titled, um, I think we have it up there, I wrote it wrong, Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read the book, I would encourage you to read it. I've read it. It's an absolutely fascinating read. He concluded, Victor, as he was there in those Nazi death camps, concluded that those who live to get something out of life, in other words, those who live for happiness are unable to cope with suffering. And as he observed the prisoners, he came to these conclusions. And he also came to the conclusion that, 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 that those who live for meaning, in other words, those who go through life and their ultimate goal isn't happiness, but they go through life and they're looking for meaning, they're looking for purpose, realize that there is something more important in life than your personal happiness. Here's what Victor realized, and, and if I can just summarize the book, Victor realized that happiness is not the ultimate goal of life. Let me say it this way. God does not exist to make you happy. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. It's not that God doesn't want you to be happy. It's not that God hasn't given us everything we need for happiness, but, but God's purpose, he does not exist to make you and I happy. That is a countercultural statement. It goes against our me generation, does it not? It goes against our selfie generation where, where you and I are the center of our universe. And everything is about us. And if we're not careful, we move God from the center of the universe, who is supposed to be the center of the universe, and we push him out of the way, and we make life about us. And we treat God as if God was a cosmic vending machine whose sole responsibility is to give us everything we need and fix our life in a way that we do not have to experience suffering. God's ultimate goal is not to make you happy. His ultimate goal is not pleasure, it's not delight, it's not ecstasy. Here's what I want you to catch. God wants you to be holy more than he wants you to be happy. Now, now, that doesn't mean I, I don't want you to sit back and say, oh, my word, okay, i got to resign myself to a life of unhappiness if I'm going to be holy. As a matter of fact, I would submit to you that there is no happier life than, than trying to honor and glorify Jesus Christ in all that we do. And as we strive for holiness, there is deep-seated not just happiness, but there is deep-seated joy and satisfaction and contentment in our life. But as American believers, we blow it because we view God as if his ultimate goal is to make me happy, and you will not find that in Scripture. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul defines what God wants for your life and mine. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, you know verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, notice this, for those who he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to live happily ever after. Is that what the verse says? No. He predestined us what? To be conformed to the image of his son. So God's ultimate goal for your life is for you and I to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, holiness in our lives. Let me refute a second myth. The second myth is this. The presence of suffering in your life does not indicate that God is absent, but rather that God is at work. How many of us have ever gone through a trial? Maybe it was a deep trial. Maybe you lost a, a parent. Maybe you lost a spouse. Could grieve. Maybe you lost a child. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you went through a, a, a huge financial crisis. 
And your cry was, God, where are you? God, are you present? Are you at work? Or, or God, have you abandoned me? Here's what we mean when we say that or when we think that. What we mean is that because God didn't relieve our pain, because God didn't remove the trial, because God didn't end the suffering, we feel as if God is absent, as if God left the building, as if God abandoned us. Here's what happens. Our immaturity keeps us from understanding what God is trying to accomplish. Let me use an illustration. So I just wanted to put a picture of uh, my granddaughter up on the screen. So there's Mark and there's Mark and Sophia. All right. So Sophia's a a year old now. All right. So 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 around their apartment there in Wisconsin, Sophia is notorious for getting into things that she shouldn't get into. And so she'll, she'll grab the trash can and pull the trash can down. And if they're not careful, she's digging into the trash can. And all of the stuff in the trash can, it looks good to her. And she's as happy as can be rummaging through the trash can. Or she can, you know, reach out and touch something that's hot. And Mark, in his infinite wisdom, in April, in her infinite wisdom, realized that food in the trash can is not the healthiest food for her. And so what do they tell her? No. They might even slap her hand. At that moment, Sophia's thinking, what are you doing? Well, you're robbing me of happiness. The, the, this trash can food is making me happy. Here's the idea, and I don't want to believe, uh, uh, linger the point. A, a 27-year-old dad is much wiser than a one-year-old daughter. Does that make sense? Uh, the gap, the wisdom gap there is huge. What is the wisdom gap between an omniscient, eternal God? And Brian, don't you think that, that what I think is going to make me happy, God in his sovereignty, God in his wisdom looks down and says, Brian, don't put your hands in that. That's dirty. Brian, that's not going to help you. That's going to hurt you. And there are things that happen in our lives that just don't make sense to us. But church, that doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to an almighty, compassionate God. My heart was broken like yours last Sunday. We got home and we heard about the shooting. How in the world could a deranged man walk into a church and kill 26 innocent people? the majority of them children. How could that happen? I've had all kinds of people ask me this week, Brian, how could God allow that to happen? Couldn't God have stopped it? I wish I had a profound answer for you today. I do know this, that I know that the heart of God was broken just as much as your heart is broken and my heart is broken by that. And we sit back and it doesn't make any sense to us whatsoever. And it's in cases like that that you and I need to trust in a sovereign God. That somehow in his infinite wisdom, somehow in his infinite compassion, He knows something that I don't know. And he knows something that you don't know. But let's please not accuse God of not suffering. Let's please not accuse God of being hard-hearted. I read again John chapter 11 this week when Jesus stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus. And, And shortest verse in the Bible, you know the verse, it says, And Jesus wept. I think it's profound that that the God of the universe would demonstrate emotion at that point. But the word wept is an unbelievably deep word. It not only carries the idea of frustration, but it carries the idea of immense anger. As Jesus looked at the tomb of Lazarus, he was mad at death. He was mad at sin. He was angered at the injustice that was taking place. And he had all the power at that moment to do everything he needed to do to erase it and act like it didn't happen. And yet it is sovereignty. 
God knew and understood something that Mary and Martha and the rest of them did not understand. Oh, church, catch this. In your suffering, God is not absent. He hasn't turned his back on you. He hasn't forgotten about you. I assure you of the fact that he's present in your life. He's doing something in your life that only he understands. I made two statements in the outline. If you're following along, the first is this. Security produces complacency. That's what happens in our life. It's what happens in our country. Security and prosperity produce complacency in our lives. Because we have everything that we need. We seemingly don't need God. And so what happens? We forget about God until what happens? Until tragedy strikes. And all of a sudden when tragedy strikes, who do we turn to? We turn to God. Here's a classic illustration. The Sunday after 9-11. Our churches were packed all across our country. Why? Because we had lost our security. We didn't know if other attacks were coming. Uh, we were so confident in our own security before no one could ever attack our borders. And it happened within our borders. And, and the security that we felt we lost in an instant. And it drove the American people where? To churches all across our country. And it drove people to fall on their knees and cry out to God. But then when a week half passed, and another week passed, and another attack didn't come, all of a sudden, what did we feel? Secure. We no longer needed God like we needed him the Sunday after 9-11. Security produces complacency, but suffering produces dependency. When we go through something, we are reminded of our utter dependence upon God. And God takes pleasure in that. So, so two myths. Number one, God's ultimate goal for your life is not happiness. It's holiness. He, he wants to dry, he wants to make you just like Jesus Christ. And suffering does not mean that God is absent. To the contrary, he's present. He's suffering with you. And he's trying to accomplish something greater, something eternal in your life and mine. Let me show you a second truth that we pull from the passage. The second truth that we see in our text is this. Godly living will not exempt you from unjust treatments. Uh, the, the context is interesting, and, and, and we could debate the context, but we find slaves, slavery here in the passage, and, 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 and I would submit that's a conversation for another day, that slavery is, a, is something that God hates as much as you and I do, but it was a part of, of the, the first century church. Slaves actually formed a large part of the Christian community. So in, in churches like ours, there would be slaves that would be present worshiping along with non-slaves, along with even masters of slaves within the same congregation. And here Peter addresses his comments to Christian slaves who had cruel, unjust masters. As a result, many of them were treated harshly. Many of them were treated viciously. And they were treated unjustly. As a matter of fact, the text seems to indicate that they were beaten. The word that is used in the passage, and we won't take the time to look at it, is the word pummeled. <laughs> And so Peter uses the word, he said, you are being beat up, you are being pummeled because of your faith. We could sit back and say, man, what was the offense? Why were these masters beating their slaves? Had they done something wrong? Were they, were they not working hard? Were they dishonest? Why were they being beaten? Here's what Peter indicates. They were beaten because they were living godly lives. They were slaves who were living in the worst of circumstances, yet they were living out the Christian faith. They, they were trying their hardest to be like Jesus Christ. And their lives, their response to cruel, unjust, ungodly treatment was to live in such a way that their actions and their attitudes convicted their masters 
and drove those masters to beat them even more. What's the admonition for us? Thank God we don't have that in our country. But what's the admonition for us? The admonition is this, don't allow unjust treatment to keep you from doing what is right. Oh, that, that ought to resonate in our hearts and minds. As believers, we cannot allow unjust, undeserved treatment to keep us from doing what is right. Let me just read a couple of verses that are in the passage. Some we already read and some we didn't. In verse 17, Peter says, honor everyone. Not just those who honor you, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God. Notice this, honor the emperor. Who? Nero. We talked about him last week. A man who was killing Christians by the scores. Peter tells those believers, honor the emperor. Verse 18, he says, be subject to your masters. How? With all respect. Tremendous admonition for us as well. Dishonest, unjust, and undeserved treatment does not give the believer license to act in a non-Christian manner. You might sit back today and say, man, Brian, you have no idea how badly my boss treats me. You have, you have no idea how my neighbor responds to me. Man, you know what? Tit for tat, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. They treat me this way. This is the way I'm going to treat them. Peter says, no, nah, that's not the way you respond as a believer. Unjust, undeserved treatment does not give us the right to act in an ungodly way. But there's a deeper thought in the passage. He says that, but there's a deeper thought. Notice verses 20 and 21. He says this, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you do well. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. We saw that. But the next phrase is mind-blowing. He says this, for to this you have been called. I wrote down in my notes and I prayed about all week long. Called to do what? <laughs> he tells the recipients of this letter, he said, you have been called to this. And, and, and the message transcends generations. It speaks to us. You and I have been called to this. Called to what? Is the question that leaps from the pages. And the answer very simply is this. You have been called to suffer. You and I have been called to suffer. Can I show you a few other verses? And we kind of jump over this truth. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but notice the next phrase, but also to what? Suffer for his sake. And, and, and here's what we do. We contextualize that. Oh, Brian, come on now. Come on, that was written to the first century church who was under Nero. And, and yeah, okay, they were called to suffer, but man, we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that's not speaking to us. Is it not? What happened if tomorrow we lost our freedom? What happened if tomorrow it was no longer allowed for us to worship together? What would happen tomorrow if standing up for Christ in your workplace caused you to lose your job, ostracized from your family? You say, Brian, that'll never happen. Let's pray that it never happens. But it's happening to Christians right now all over the world. Peter says this, you have been called to suffer. suffer. Suffering is part of the Christian experience. Notice Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul makes this state, great statement. He says, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. Well, we love that part. And may I share in the fellowship of his sufferings. I'd venture to say, I don't know everybody here today, but I, I, I'd venture to say there's probably, probably not a single one of us who have prayed, God, help me to experience the power of your resurrection. And Lord, today, I want to share your sufferings with you. We wouldn't pray that. Who would pray that? 
If we heard somebody pray that in a prayer meeting, man, we'd lift our eyebrow thinking, what in the world are they praying? Did they, they're like one rock shy of a load, right? But Paul says, man, my, my desire is to know you, to know the power of your resurrection and sharing in your sufferings. Can I submit a question to you? Maybe we don't know him like we should. Maybe we don't experience the power of the resurrection in our lives because we have no idea what suffering is like. We've never suffered. We've never, we've never had to run to him and plead for the safety of our kids. We've never had to run to him and plead because there's no food whatsoever anywhere for our family and we can't get our hands on it. We've never had to run to him in that sense. So maybe we don't know him like we should. Suffering is part of the Christian experience. As believers, we've been called to suffer. So what's the admonition as we, as a staff, as we thought about this and we prayed through this passage this week, we sat back and thought, okay, what is the, what is the message? Yes, different generation, different culture. But what is the message that resonates to us? If we, had, if we had, you know, first century believers here alongside of 21st century believers here, what, what is the message that leaps all of those generations and speaks to every single one of us? And here's the conclusion we came to. Don't waste your suffering. However severe it may be, it might not be near as severe as believers in, uh, in communist countries that are having to hide for their faith. It might not be near as severe as, as families in the Sudan who, uh, who live in extreme poverty. But whatever your suffering is, don't waste your suffering. God has a divine purpose behind your suffering. What a tragedy it is for you and I to go through pain to go through heartache, to go through disappointment, and not use our suffering for his honor and for his glory. As I mentioned last week, we have a tendency to focus on what is infecting us instead of focusing on who is indwelling us. Uh, Jose is, is preaching in Spanish right now, and, and as we talked through this this morning, he had, he had two great thoughts that I would add. He, he, had, he had this thought. He said, God uses suffering in your life. He uses suf God uses suffering in your life to sanctify you. He does. That's why James says in James chapter 1, count it all joy when what? When you go through different, different trials. When you experience different pains, why? Because God is using the trying of your patience, the trying of your faith to what? To accomplish something in your life. And, and so suffering is a tool that God wants to use in your life to draw you and I closer to him. But Jose also said something that's profound. Suffering is a tool that you can use for evangelism. In other words, as you and I experience suffering in a completely abnormal, a completely different way, we're able to point people to Jesus Christ because we suffer differently than they do. And so I ask you today, what, what if, what if, would you imagine with me today, what if we viewed suffering through a different lens? What if instead of complaining of our suffering, we asked God to use it for his glory? I wonder. I wonder if the petitions on our prayer list would be just a little different. James chapter 5 tells us that we're supposed to pray for the sick and we do that, but what if our prayer request changed? We're always going to pray for healing, but what if our prayer request changed to this? God, use my cancer to bring my family to Jesus Christ. What if that became my prayer? God, God use my job loss to show others how to live godly in adverse circumstances. Instead of using as a megaphone to complain about the way that I was treated, God, 
What if, what if God, you enabled me to use this, this, this situation that's hard, but to show others how a Christian lives in this situation? God, what if my financial struggles grew my faith and taught me to be more dependent on you? Let's not waste our suffering. Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 say this. Uh, Catch these. They're up on the screen. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us. Not my words. Paul's words. This this momentary, we saw last week that affliction is temporary, it's temporal, it's not going to last forever. And and so Paul, who himself was going through persecution, Paul says, this light momentary affliction is preparing us, what? For an eternal weight of glory. How? Beyond all comparison. Here's what he's saying. The suffering that you're experiencing now is nothing compared to the glory that you're going to experience later. And the glory that you are going to experience later is going to help you to forget all about the suffering that you experienced. In fact, I believe with all of my heart, and it's a subject for a different day, that I believe that part of the, part of the goal of the gospel is to make right everything that was made wrong because of sin. And God in his wisdom, God in his glory, God in his grace, God in his mercy is going to one day make it all make sense to you and me. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see this situation through an eternal lens. Help me not to see this situation through through my transient, self-centered, me being the center of the universe lens. Help me to see my situation as you see my situation. Boy, that would completely change our perspective. There's another thing in the passage that's even more powerful. Let me hit it. I know my time is is almost done. But the third thing that Peter says is this. Like Jesus, you have been called to suffer. He, He said it. I already alluded to it in verse 21. For this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you. Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. The word example is a really interesting word. It's a Greek word that literally means to trace over. The other day I was up in uh, uh, Ms. Torres' room. I, I, I think I, I don't know what grade Anna teaches. Um, second, what, what grade does Ms. Torres teach, Mike? First grade. There you go, first grade. Tells you how much I know. Um, first grade. And so they had these pads out when I walked, and they were working on their writing. And so they literally had this pattern, and they were tracing over the pattern, learning to write those words. That's the exact meaning of this word. For this you are called, because Christ has left you what? An example, a pattern, a footstep that you should follow. The idea is just as a child puts his feet in the footsteps of his father there in the sand or his mother, so you and I have the responsibility, whatever we're going through in our life, to look for the footsteps of Jesus and to put our feet in those footsteps. For this you have been called. Because Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow. And he said, man, there's so much depth in this passage. Why? why, uh, We sit back and we look at suffering like Texas again, and we sit back and think, boy, boy, where, where was God in all of that? And there's two aspects of God that we cling to in moments like this. We cling to his sovereignty. 
We cling to the fact that he is a good God who is in charge and nothing happens outside the realm of his control as we've already talked about it. He has a greater purpose that we may not understand, but we trust that. If it was just that that we clung to, that would be really different, but we not only cling to the, so- to the sovereignty of God. Follow me today. We cling to the suffering of God as well. He's not only a sovereign God, he is a suffering God. For to this you were called, not because God looked down from heaven and said, you got to go through this. To this you were called because he also, what? Suffered for you and me, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Dr. John Dixon is, is an apologist who was speaking at the university campus in Sydney, Australia. His topic was the wounds of God. And he spoke about the suffering of the Savior. And during a question and answer session, a Muslim rose, a a very, very um, intelligent, very well-spoken Muslim man rose to explain how preposterous it was to think that the creator of the universe would subject himself to human limitations. The creator of the universe would have to eat, would have to sleep, would have to go to the bathroom. The creator of the universe would die on a cross. The Muslim man stood and says, it defies human logic. It doesn't make any sense. John Dixon stood there for a second. He had no witty response. He had no powerful reply. He simply looked at the Muslim man and thanked him for making the uniqueness of Jesus Christ crystal clear. You see, here's what I'm saying today. What Muslims and the rest of the world denounce as blasphemous, the Christians declare as precious. He was wounded for us. Peter says in the passage, he not only suffered, notice the passage, he says, and to this you were called, for he suffered, how did he suffer? For you. Two words I want you to catch, and I got to be done. First of all, his suffering was vicarious. His suffering was vicarious. He died for you, and he died for me. He died in our place, in our stead, so that we do not have to suffer. The hope that we cling to, in just a few hours, I'm I'm preaching the funeral of a a gentleman who sat right over to my right, William Gersten Meyer. Some of you knew William, one one of the sweetest men, smile on his face all the time. He went home to be with the Lord this past week, and I'm probably going to speak out of John chapter 11. It says, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And, and, and God makes the statement, he says, though we are dead, yet shall we live. Why is that? Why do we have hope today? We have hope because of what Jesus Christ did for us. His suffering was vicarious. If you're here today and you have never personally trusted Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for you, I submit to you the fact that he died. He didn't die the death of a martyr. He didn't die in vain. He died intentionally for you and for me. His death was vicarious, but his death was also victorious. Four things I'll give them to you quickly and I'm done. He suffered innocently. It said he committed no sin neither was deceit found in his mouth. There's not a single innocent person here today. We might be good, we might even be really good, but there's not a single one of us who are innocent. But he's innocent. He died innocently. He he died, he died without retaliation. The passage says when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he threatened, he he didn't threaten. I, I always say, if I would have been Jesus on the cross, I would have looked down at my persecutors, my crucifiers, and I would have said with a smile on my face, I will see you in hell. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't threaten. He didn't revile. As a matter of fact, his petition on the cross was not that they be condemned, but his petition on the cross was what? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He suffered without retaliation. He suffered with faith. It says, entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The word entrust means to deliver over someone to over someone else to manage. 
And Jesus sat back. If anybody has been treated unjustly, it was Jesus Christ. And then he did what? By faith, he turned it over to God the Father. And he entrusted himself to him who will judge justly. And lastly, he suffered for a purpose. What was his purpose? Verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. <laughs> Please catch that. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He didn't die on the cross so that you could live a wonderful life right now. So that you could experience all the wealth that this world has to offer. That's not why Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross so that you and I might die to sin. And so that you and I might live to righteousness. And that us lost sheep might be brought back to the shepherd, the overseer of our souls. So, so can I ask you today, what is God trying to accomplish in your life? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this. All things work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he called, he foreknew, and those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son change of perspective. God, I don't want to waste my suffering. I want to use my suffering, whatever it is, for your honor and for your glory. Would you stand with me, Stephen, and the team are going to come. Maybe you're here today and you have never by faith reached out to Jesus Christ and by faith accepted his gift, his substitutionary gift of his death on the cross for you. That's the starting point. I would encourage you to make that all important decision. If you want to, we have leaders down front, we have uh, elders and deacons on the side who, if you want to, they would love to pray with you. Maybe today you're going through a struggle and, and you're trying to make sense of the struggle, whatever it is. I would encourage you to come and give that struggle to Jesus. Realizing that he understands your struggle more than I ever could more than anyone else ever could. And he's suffering with you. And he wants to give you the strength and the power and the grace to go through it and to point others to him in the process.